I would have thought that by now I would have discovered every way to mess up a video for a sermon. And it turns out that I found a new way to mess up a video. And the annoying thing is I'm not even sure exactly how I did it either. I, uh, I changed the SD card and maybe that impacted the... I don't know. The point being, uh, I had become aware that the audio for the sermon this last Sunday was bad. And so uh, here is the sermon take two. For those of you who uh, the echoing got annoying. What cartoons did you watch growing up? I watched G.I. Joe, X-Men, Transformers. And my children today, they uh, watch the old Scooby-Doo. I don't know why, but they've really latched on to the old Scooby-Doo. The ones where um, the animation, the top half of their body doesn't move, but the bottom half moves when they run. It's I love it. Uh, they love it too. The other thing that they've really latched on to is a cartoon called Bluey. And in the link, in the description of this video, there is a link if you would like to watch one of these, uh, the cartoon I'll be talking about briefly today. And then I hope you do, do go and watch it because it is uh, truly delightful. So if you have the ability, go on, just pause me right now, click on that, and then come back. Uh, if not, let me tell you about the cartoon you're uh, you, you, that, that my children, one of them, my children watches. In this particular cartoon, the uh, two there are two uh, children, two dog children, and two parents who are also dogs. And uh, the two children are playing with a balloon, playing keepy uppy, just knocking the balloon up in the air. And the uh, the father, the dad, he comes in and they ask him to make it more challenging. Can he make it more challenging? And he just he picks one of them up and flips them over and says, oh, I need to read the news newspaper. He starts reading the back of his child's uh, back, back like it's a newspaper. And then it's hard for the other child to keep the balloon in the air. Or he, uh, the, well, the child gets free. And like at one point he says, oh, it's so hot in here. And he turns on the fan and the balloon goes flying away. And the children are squealing it with uh, delight. And um, to s this particular cartoon, this one is seven minutes long. At the end of the cartoon... They end up all on the floor uh, laughing, all the family. They've been playing a, with a balloon. And that's it. That's the end of the cartoon. And what's interesting to me is that it is completely lacking one of the things that is often in a lot of children's uh, literature, children's videos. Like the, there's, like there's a, some sort of moral, like, here's what you should do, and that's why you should do this, little Timmy. And, and there's some sort of, like, moral to it, civic lesson or something. And in this one, there, there is no civic lesson. It's a family, and they're having fun. I thought of that this week as I was reading about uh, Paul. And Paul writes to the letter at the church at Thessalonica. And I'm, I need to, I'm going to tell you about that letter. I'm going to read it to you first. I'm going to tell you about it. And we're going to get back to those, those dogs and that cartoon called Bluey in a minute. It, it, it'll take a minute. Here, here we go. So Paul writes to the churches. This is the first chapter of First Thessalonians, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and attention and mention you in prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that God has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith of God in God has become known. So if we look at how Paul starts at church, like Thessalonica, this is where he writes this letter to them. What Paul does is he goes, he rolls into town, and he gets a job. He's working usually as a tent maker. And so he knows people, because he's working with them. And then he goes to the synagogue, 
and he can tell the people, the Jews gathered there for worship on, on, on the Sabbath, on Saturday, that uh, the Messiah you've been praying for has arrived. And then he can go to the Agora, which is where the sort of Greek uh, public entertainment, you might say. It's the forum, the, a space where people can stand up and, and, and debate and argue and philosophize. And if you wanted to have a good time, you would go down there and you would listen to people debate and see who was entertaining, who was convincing, talking about what they believed. And then so Paul could go there and argue, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. This, this is what you need to know. And he could make his case. And so he would gather these people together as co-workers, Jews who were interested, people who had heard him speak at the Agora. And what did he have to work with? Well, he could tell them first, let me tell you about Jesus, right? Let me tell you about Jesus, what he did and said, the parables, life, death, resurrection. He has what we would now call the gospel. Right? He has the stories. But he also has himself. He can point to himself and say, and do what I do. Right? Look at how I follow Jesus and then do the same. And, and this is what uh, this is the way that Paul had been trained at, when he was being raised. It was what uh, Jesus had done with his disciples. If, if you look at what happens in the Gospels, Jesus takes people and says, follow me, and then they do what he does for years. Right? There's this idea of imitation uh, of do what I do. Do what I do. That, that's how Paul could show people, Paul could teach people how, how to follow Jesus. And then Paul praises them because you're so good at imitating me, other people, and, and thus Jesus, that other churches, other communities from all around what we would now call Greece, uh, then was Achaia and Macedonia, they're all looking at you and saying, ah, they're on to something. We want to do it like they do it. Like, they're the ones, they've got this figured out. And so he's praising them because this is how uh, the other churches are learning how to follow Jesus. And it struck me that imitation is not something we're really comfortable talking about today. Like, that's how Peter or that's how Paul led people and how the first churches began were by lots of imitation. And we don't talk about it. And I think part of it is because uh, we're uncomfortable. Like if, if someone came up to one of us and said, let me imitate you, we would be kind of, oh, are you sure about that? I'm not, I don't want, I'm not sure I like that. And if I was to ask you to imitate me, uh, that feels really arrogant. I would imitate you. Why would I imitate you? Yet, if we were to start sort of working out what we want to be like, we have to confess that imitation helps us know what we can do, right? If, if I was to tell you what type of dad I wanted to be like, I want to be like the dog in that cartoon. Now, if you go watch that cartoon, Bluey, B-L-U-E-Y, go watch that cartoon, please. It's, they're just fabulous, right? If you go watch that cartoon, what you would see is, a dad who is just completely involved in the laughter and the life and the joy and the playing with his children. I want to be a dad like him. All right. And that's how imitation works. I want to be like him. And so if I was to tell you what type of pastor I want to be like, it's the same thing. Like I want to be like, I could tell you I want to be a pastor who is wise and humble and bold uh, but what I really should say is I want to be a pastor like my friend Joel was a pastor, who, for he is always learning and learning and learning and learning and learning. My friend Joel is always learning and reading and, and seeking out continuing education. I want to be wise like my friend Joel. I want to imitate him. I want to imitate uh, the humility of my friend John, who is uh, always willing to do what it takes uh, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of preaching, for the sake of reaching people. And I take myself way too seriously, and I see in John something that I need to imitate. And I want to be bold like my friend Rich. My friend Rich, um, he is constantly seeking to figure out the big thing that the church he leads can do, that he can do, so that people can break through the normal. Because we have a normal sense of how the world works, and he wants to break through that with something abnormal, something big, something that gets people's attention so that he can help them understand some something, a truly abnormal message that God loves you. And, and so I want to, I could tell you, I want to be wise, 
humble and bold, but I really want to be is to imitate my friends, uh, Joel, John, and Rich. And the same thing when it comes to uh, what type of church that uh, I want to lead. Like if I, I could tell you the church that I want to read, lead is one that is wise and patient on the things that need it and bold and quick on the things that need that. Like, and I can tell you that, but what I should do is point up to Palmyra. Palmyra Methodist Church, up the road from here, about an hour away, they've been building their building for over a decade now. They're building a new building. And to build a new building takes a lot of wisdom and discernment and planning. You have, there's just so much wrapped up into building a new building. Uh, and so you gotta take your time and bring everyone along. And it's taken them a decade, taking them far, far longer than it looks like they, they need it on paper. But that's how long they needed to do it wisely and patiently and to make sure that they, they chose to, uh, they made decisions that would hold the church together and would refine and focus what their, their understanding as a church. And I just have great respect for them for doing that. They were slow and wise and patient on what they needed to be. And then it turns out then they, uh, when they needed to move fast, they had this opportunity. Some of their youth wanted to uh, run the youth group and try something. And so they said, yeah, go for it. What do you need? And they did it. Right? And so that knowing when to be wise and patient, when to be bold, I, that's the type of church I want to lead. That's why I want to lead towards. I want to be like that church. It is this ability to imitate, this ability to, to look at someone and say, I want to be like them, right? That is what helps us find new ways forward. Right? I, there's a lady that, um, when Olivia and I were uh, contemplating a future together, like she had all these questions about, oh, she was, my wife's not Methodist, right? She wanted to know, like, if I'm going to marry a Methodist pastor, how is this going to work? Like pay, housing, appointments, supervision, all of these things. Am I going to be expected to be Methodist? Do I have to play the piano? Like all these things that she just had no familiarity with. Like, and I gave her all the information, but that really wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for her to try something knew what made it possible for her to do this. I introduced uh, my wife to a lady named Carmen Ward. And Carmen was the retired music teacher who had, was married to a retired Methodist pastor. And, and sitting down, sitting the two of them down together, like Carmen could tell her stories and Olivia could say, you know what, I can do that. I can imitate that. That's what I can do. And so that's the way, that's example of how we work. Like we see someone and we say, ah, I want to do that. I can do that because now I've seen someone else do it. And, and that's what, that, that's what we see Paul talking about, right? He, I'm, he's praising them because he's praising the people at Thessalonica because they have imitated him and, and now people are imitating them. And this is wonderful. And so we're left with this, uh, the final sort of piece of this is Okay, Andy, that all works. So now are we going to imitate you? Because in the, the logic of this letter, like the, I'm the leader in this church in this context, and Paul's leader in that context. So like, Andy, you about to say that we should all imitate you? Well, let me tell you one more story, and then I'll answer that question. There was a point in the history early on in the church where people there are some people who would go off and pray for the church and pray for the world. And, and others join them. And over time, the, these people, gatherings of small groups of people who are praying for the world and for the church uh, become known as monks and nuns. And they're the beginnings of the monastic communities. And the unfortunate thing that happened is that they began to be seen by the rest of Christians as like the, the good Christians. Like there's people following Jesus and doing all of it, doing it right, the monks and the nuns. And then there's the rest of us schlubs down here, right? We're, we're, we'll kind of get by, we'll do the best we can, but it's those monks and those nuns, like they're the ones who can really follow Jesus fully and do all the things Jesus talks about. We're just kind of going to get by. And this bifurcation, it, it still creeps up. Like, and I see it today in this idea that like pastors are like the professional Christians. We hire you to be Christian for us. Like it's sort of how it can feel at times. And let me just say, phooey. 
I, I just, I profound, I cannot tell you how profoundly I disagree with that. There are skills that pastors develop that are specialized, like to preach, to lead worship, like that's a somewhat specialized skill. But the things that pastors do that make them Christians are the same thing that everyone else does. Right? The things that I do as a Christian, I do as a Christian because I'm, I follow Jesus, right? And so if we're going to talk about imitation, it, it has nothing to do with the, some of the specialized skills around leading worship. It has to do with imitating the things that I do because I follow Jesus. I did them before I was a pastor. I will do them if I, if I cease being a pastor. These are the things I'm going to keep on doing. The things that I'm talking about are reading the Bible. I started reading the Bible in college because I saw other people reading the Bible, and I got up in the morning, and I started reading the Bible, and that's still what I do. I still get up in the morning, and part of my morning is I read the Bible. I read the Bible, and I pray, and, and, um, and I try to serve. And I, I learned to serve at the, a church I went to in North Carolina. A bunch of guys at that church said, we go out once a month on a Saturday to help rebuild people's houses. Can you come with us? And I said, yeah, because I saw them doing it. I said, I can imitate that. I can do that, too. Right? I can imitate people who read their Bible. I can do that, too. I saw people who were going out and willing to swing a hammer for Jesus, and I said, yeah, I can do that, too. Like, the things that Paul is talking about imitating have nothing to do with, with any specialized job of pastor. It has everything to do with just the basics of being a Christian. And so if you look at me and you have any sense that I am someone that reads and prays and serves people, and you want to imitate that, okay, please imitate me. But let's be clear, in imitating me, what you're really doing is you're imitating Jesus, because that's what I'm doing. I, I, I am looking at Jesus, I'm reading about Jesus, I'm praying to Jesus, I'm serving in his name, and if you'd like to join me in doing that, please do so. But whether it's me or whether it's someone else, I hope each of us can find the people that we're imitating, that we're seeking to follow, and that in following what they're doing, they're helping us become more like who, who Jesus is. And such that uh, Paul can say, uh, Paul can say of us what he says of the church at Thessalonica: "You imitated me, and you did such a great job that people are now looking at you and saying, ah, I want to be like them because those people, they are the people. When I look at them, they remind me of Jesus.'" Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your servant, Paul. Thank you for all the people who looked to him and saw someone to imitate, saw someone who, in following Paul, knew that they could follow you. We pray that you would guide us to choose people to imitate in our lives. We pray that we might Im be imitatable. We pray that the people from this church, the people from churches across the nation and across the world, as we go and go forth, people might see us and see people that they can uh, respect and imitate and desire to be like. We pray, continue to pray for this nation as it grapples with the vaccinations and the healthcare systems that still struggle with so many people who are sick and ill. We pray for all these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and always, and please pray for our video equipment that hopefully it works out better next week. <laughs>